We're back on the Boston Connection with, um, oh, we're back on all of our Boston with Tyreek D. Lee, the Executive Vice President of SEIU 1199. And you know what, Tyreek, I like your story. Ah, I really you. do. You started to work at the uh, Boston Medical yes. Center. You were a telephone operator. Telephone operator. And now yeah. you're leading the charge. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Only in America. Yes. Exciting. Congratulations. Pull, pulling myself up and working my way up. Is how I Let's like to talk about it. that. How does that make you feel every day when you walk in as the big dog in the union that you started in BMC? I know. It feels really good. I mean, first of all, I have folks that believed in me. You know, I think that that's something that we all need is folks who really believe in you, like my predecessor, Veronica Turner or Celia Whistlow. Um, and it feels really good to walk in every day and realize that I have a good job, I'm able to provide for my family, but we're also really trying to change the, the lives of workers in our communities that we live in. So it feels really, really good to so be a part of this. So you were one of those people that, whose lives were changed oh, by the intersection of a union, Oh, right? absolutely. I mean, I at Boston Medical Center through uh, our 1199 uh, SEIU training fund, I actually got my high school diploma working at Boston Medical Center. And the 1199 training fund is a co-mingle fund. We do it with our employers. Um, and it allowed me to go back to school and actually walk across the stage. I'm a father of three by the age of 20. Um, and so You had a rough kind of stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you know. And so all three of them got to see me walk across the stage. My and goodness. so I'm clearly, uh, you know, feel like an inspiration to them, but also other young fathers out there who may feel like, you know what, I came out the box maybe a little wrong, but if you believe in yourself, and you have others out there that believe in you, you absolutely can make the way. So you were a real power of example for so many people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was absolutely. very impressed when I Thank read you. about you. Thank You're you. welcome. It really. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's unbelievable. It, and the people, let's talk about your union. Mm -hmm. Your union has 52,000 members in Massachusetts. Yes. And 8,000 in Boston. Just in Boston alone, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, oh, that's, that's a big union. That's huge, that's huge. And you're located at the Corcoran Jenison building, right? And well, no longer. No we're longer. actually, yeah, we're actually in Quincy now. Oh, you are? Um, about five minutes from where we were. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, we moved about two, three months ago. Oh, okay. Um, but as we look at it, I mean, we have thousands of members, as you know, in Boston, um, but also thousands in the Gateway City. So our union is not the building that yeah, we are. Yeah, no, we're no, in no, the communities. no, I know. Um, but yeah, you know, we moved a couple a couple months ago, and you know, this journey has been, as you put it at the beginning, it's just been life changing for me, my family, and I want to do the same for others out there. You know, let's one, talk about your membership. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're not one percenters. No, not at all. They're the people that make the trains go on time, and you know, I was struck. My mother passed away recently, and mm -hmm. before she died, Sorry. we had. Um, a personal care. Mm -hmm. Home care worker, yes. personal care attendant, yes. And you guys uh, lobbied to get the personal care attendants fifteen dollars an hour. Yes. And that even even that by itself, if that's the only thing you did, you would have impressed <laughs> the hell out of me. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they they had ten dollars an hour yeah. prior to unionizing uh, in two thousand and seven. And today they're on the pathway to fifteen. They have a voice on the job. Right. They have the training fund so they can go back to school as well and get either skills for the current job or future jobs. Um, so that was a life changing moment. Yeah. Absolutely. For twenty two thousand workers at the time of the organizing drive, which is now up to thirty five thousand workers as the home care program continues to grow. And people don't get it, I guess, until uh, it becomes part of your life, like myself. Yeah. How important those the work that they do is so critically important. Absolutely. And we're paying people $10 an hour. Yeah, and we got to make sure that the consumers have a choice. Right. Some want to stay at home, so right. we got to make sure we're able to provide the quality care that they deserve. Um, and so it was really important to uplift those workers and do a lot of work with the consumer base, who's the folks who, need, who have the need, and make sure that we're working together. That's what partnership look like, and that's what's just changing folks' lives every day. So you think that this election is critically important, no, even if please. you're obviously supporting Hillary Clinton. Yes. But even if Hillary Clinton doesn't win, you believe that the organizational prowess of your union is critically important. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have an issue platform that we went out and talked to our members about that have a wide range of issues from racial, social, economic justice to the green planet. Um, and it's important that in politics, it's not just about the candidate. 
you know, Hillary Clinton is our candidate, but we are prepared and out there at the doors every day talking to our members, uh, talking to the communities that they live in, and really talking about the importance of standing together after November 8th. Hillary wins, we got to be there to support her where she needs, and if need be, we need to hold her accountable. And if she loses, we need a massive movement out there to deal with the other side of that particular issue um, in the election. Trump is not a supporter of workers. He does not look out for the best interests or does not speak for the country as a whole. So it's important that our work on the ground really brings out folks from where they are and, and, and band together to where we need to be. It's just, it's, it's what we do in politics. We do not just sign a check and then let the person get elected. We're there for them to support them if it's our candidate. And if it's not our candidate, we're absolutely holding them accountable. And even more so, if it is our candidate and something right. happens, we're absolutely at the State House or in D.C. making sure that our voices is heard and putting them back in line. So you were born and raised in Boston. I was yeah. born and raised in Boston. Um, my dad was a janitor. Um, I understand what it takes to buy a home. How can somebody today that makes fifteen dollars an hour even mm. rent an apartment? How do you, how do you motivate your membership to go knock on doors for all of these folks that make a ton of money more than they do, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, tell me how you do that? I mean, it must be so hard. Yeah, it's difficult, you know, because folks are struggling. They're working two, three jobs. You have single moms, single yeah. dads. You know, they're trying to go back to school to you know better their education. Um, but there are three main points, I think, that we try to organize, and that is interest, capacity, and commitment. Figure out what the person's interest is. So as a, as a healthcare union and as a very progressive union, we don't go out and tell our members what they should care about. We really listen and try to make the collective. That's the interest portion. And then you really assess their capacity. You know, what can they do? Are they a single mom? Do they work three jobs? Is it phone calls they can make? Is it just calling the legislator? Um, and then that gives us a level of commitment. And being able to really know where people are and where they want to be so that, one, we're not wasting our resources. And, two, we're just not out there calling people, asking them to do things that it's like, you know what, that's not my issue yet. Um, and so we really try to go from where people are to move them where they, where they need to be or where they want to be and connecting the issues. I mean, again, a, a, a union is a group of workers with a voice. And that voice, uh, collectively, is how we're able to make action, not just me going by myself right. or you going by yourself. But imagine we go together, right. our voice is going to be heard a lot louder. And I didn't mention this at the beginning. I should have. You're the first African American to head a union in the Statewide, Commonwealth yeah. of Statewide Massachusetts. Union. Yeah. I mean, it's really exciting. I mean, and that is, you know, labor has been realigning itself for years, you know. And labor is the one, yep, brought us the weekend. A lot of things that uh, folks take for granted, child labor laws, you know, advocating for, uh, you know, just decent wages. Um, and as we realign ourselves, yes, I am the first African-American to run a statewide union um, in the Commonwealth. And my allies are proud of that. I am also the vice president of the Mass State AFL-CIO. Um, I'm also part of the SEIU State Council. I'm the secretary treasurer, part of the Boston uh, Greater Labor Council. Um, and I am embraced by my colleagues, um, which, to be honest, you know, you think about 50 years ago, could be very different. Um, and so as we realign ourselves, we're realizing that, one, our not yet union members also need a voice because our members go home. So it's not just about what happens in the workplace. Clearly, that is one way that we're right. able to advocate for better wages, better working conditions. But it's also their life when they go home. And how can we build back the real meaning of communities where folks are advocating for their geographical area in a way to make life better for all? Um, so tremendous opportunities, yes, challenges. But I see more opportunities in this movement that we're, that we're building around social, racial, and economic justice than ever before. Talk to me about the $15 an hour. Um, you, you have been leading that charge. We just mm -hmm. had huge success at BMC, right? Yeah, Boston Medical Center, Start Rage. Even going back a year before Boston Medical Center, Cambridge Health Alliance uh, went to 15. But in Boston right now, we have $15 at uh, Boston Medical Center, right. the pathway for our home care workers. South Boston Community Hospital uh, uh, has 15. Uh, Kearney, St. Elizabeth, that's also in Boston, part of the Stewart Network, yeah. is on a pathway to 15. Um, we have several nursing homes that are all also on their way. So every sector of our industry is either at 15 or trying to get their way to 15. And when will you be happy? 
Well, I mean, 15, 15 is just one piece of, the, uh, of our uh, economic fight. Uh, I mean, in reality, even 15 to me is not enough because you have to look at the other social benefits. I mean, in Boston right now, we're not paying for trash pickup, but I'm, I'm even old enough, young enough to remember when you can go to school and you didn't have to pay for the uh, after school program or you didn't have to right. pay for the equipment for the child to you know, do the sports exercises or whatever. And so 15 is one particular way that we're fighting this economic justice. But really, when the uh, playing field is leveled, and I mean really leveled and sustainably leveled, not just the one time, one year, and then we watch the gap, the income inequality uh, continue to grow, that's when I'm going to be happy. And income inequality in Boston right now is through the roof. You know, I, I was reading some uh, documents last week. I think we're one out of 97. We're first. First, um, So yeah. we had a lot of work to do. Um, and 15, again, it's just one tactic that we're using. Um, such as collective bargaining, such as, you know, out there talking to the community. All this is, is, is uh, for us, really together um, in terms of making the real social, racial, and economic justice we all deserve. So you've been at the helm since January, right? Mm -hmm. And how has it been so far? Oh, it's been great. I mean, like I said, there's challenges, but there's more opportunities. I mean, I have a, a great staff, I have a great membership. Um, and there are a lot of uh, allies and coalition groups that we're partnering with. I have a saying, right? I like to have transformational relationships versus transactional. And I think that is how we actually have a long-term vision for making the change that Boston deserves, is really reaching out to folks and trying to build a relationship around common issues that we really can make real and really try to address. Um, so folks are not out there kind of just feeling like they're spinning their wheels. Some of our challenges are long term. They'll be longer than I think I'll be in this particular role. What's your biggest challenge, do you think? Is there one that you can... Um... I would say the biggest challenge, and it's not necessarily unique to our union, but civic engagement. Getting folks out there to it's vote yeah. and not just vote, but actually, again, support the candidate that they went out there and voted for or hold them accountable. I think that's a, bi a big challenge for all of us. A lot of folks do not trust our political system. Right. But I have a saying, if you're going to, if, if you want to change the game, you got to play. And you got to play it respectfully and you got to do it right and get the end result that, you know, I think we all believe that we deserve. But I think that's the biggest challenge is keeping folks fully engaged. Again, it's one thing to advocate. It's one thing to even go to the state house. But then when you get to the poll, like our last primary, and the turnout across the city was extremely a low. Disgrace. It was a disgrace. But look about look at the decision to have a primary on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. What was up with that? Yeah, that I, I can't even put two on the two first together. day of school. On the first day of school. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I mean, I've been voting uh, now for over 21 years, and I don't think it's ever been on a Thursday. <laughs> Crazy. It was one other time. I forget when, yeah. but. Uh, you know, so that played yeah. into it, you know, but I... But you're right. If people voted, oh, my goodness. Yeah, the change that we can actually make. And, again, I tie voting to the accountability and support because I don't want folks to just think, okay, I, 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 I passed my vote or cast my vote, um, and then all the change that, you know, that candidate said was going to happen was going to happen. No, there's other pieces around uh, politics that folks should totally be engaged in. And so one of the things we do at our membership is really talk about local, state, and federal government, how it works. Um, you know, I remember first when I first started uh, just being active in general, I had no real clue. You know, who, who, who pays for the roads? Who pays for the bridges? You know, how does the tax system work? We still have a lot of folks in Boston who think we're still considered tax chooses and don't actually connect how that funding is going to the local services, such as public education, you know, the roads, the bridges, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. these things that we would say, like, okay, can we fix the road? Well, part of that is paying the taxes. Is it true when they asked you to join the union at first when you were at BMC, you said no? Yes, because <laughs> I didn't know anything about a union. Right. You know, honestly, I was like, you know, I have to pay to work, which I think a lot of not yet union or current members out there are probably like, what is this thing? You know, who pays for work? To, to Who pays to have to work? You know, and I realized in that moment, you know, after, yes, I had to, you know, pay. It wasn't, I don't want to per se was forced to, but at that moment I said, okay, I'll sign the card. I have a job. I have three kids. I don't really know what this is about. And in that department in the telecommunication, there was a particular issue that came up, and the workers came to me to say, you know what, you should call the union on our behalf. And I said, you know what, you're right. Let me go see what this is about. I pick up the phone, I call, and I realize through my social background, through my mother, my grandmother, both who were social workers, that was my outlet. 
That was my way to pick myself up personally, but also give back, which I always had in my heart of hearts. And it was nowhere better to do it than with 1199 SEIU because, again, it's not just as healthcare workers. We're not just sitting there saying, let's advocate for Medicaid, Medicare. We are in the communities as much as possible, in our gateway cities, advocating for things that are far out of healthcare, but we realize impact our members. And I'm like, why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? You know. Talk about where you are with the... Um the immigration issue because a lot of your members are mm -hmm. oh yeah Immigrants, struggling oh, with that absolutely right and, but we do have a diverse membership so one of the things that we do is we don't shy away from the conversation you know, I think that we have members as far as Berkshire, as far as the Cape, some who are not for the immigration reform in the way that we would describe it. And so we have an opportunity to actually sit, talk with our members, bring them together, first and foremost for the fact that they work in the same facility or they have like jobs, you know, RNs, housekeepers, dietary, surge techs, you name it. Um, and being able to bring them together to talk about what immigration reform means and even bringing them back in history to the, you know, the, the building of, uh, of our great nation um, and how far we can go. So it's a tough conversation at times. Um, most of our active members, again, are folks of color. Um, but I do realize if I want to make sure that our membership is in inclusive and involved, we got to have conversations across the entire Commonwealth. Um, and we do it. And we do it well. And you're also involved in Black Lives Matters, mm -hmm. which is a little bit of a controversial organization. Yeah, So absolutely. talk about that. Well, you know, Black Lives Matter, and I think some of the things that folks miss is this is not an attack um, on the police. I think that there are many things that are in between this that get lost. This is a, it's, it's an old conversation that should have been happening. Uh, that should have already happened. You know, when you think about racial justice, when you think about the target, there is no 40 acres and a mule. There's no level playing field. Think of the 99 and the 1%. I mean, race in this country is real, um, but I also think it's used for those 1% to continue to make money. It's, it's a divide tactic, as I like to put it. Um, so we absolutely support the Black Lives Matter. We absolutely support our police. And one of the things that I am really trying to work on is reaching out to both groups to figure out how we actually uh, have a dialogue here in Boston. I think that out of all the cities, I mean, we are by far uh, the better in terms of the police. And I, I think uh, I was reading something, it was the early 90s, the last time an unarmed man had uh, or, right. um, got shot in Boston. So I think we have an opportunity we to... We have been doing well, yes, comparatively. Compared yeah, to the, yeah. the rest of the country. And so we can continue to lead. Massachusetts and Boston is the first for a lot of things. Right. And so one of the things that I think we can do here is start the dialogue. we got to talk about these uh, systemic racial issues that are hitting us every day, and we've ignored them for too long. You can't keep putting Band-Aids on a problem that, you know, is, is way older than me, uh, per se. So, you know, I, I absolutely support it. We absolutely support it. Um, and we're going to continue to have discussions with our membership and anyone else out there that's willing to talk and try to real build, build real coalition around this particular issue and address it and now, put it to rest. does your union have a position on the um, charter school question? or? Yes, we have actually endorsed the No on Two campaign. Oh, you have? Absolutely, okay. Absolutely, yes, yes. I mean, you know, you look at the uh, charter school, and I have a personal issue. My son went to a charter school in Boston um, and was kicked out for underperforming. And the individual at the time who was the principal was real with me to say, I got to meet a quota. My question is, is what do you do with the 80% uh, of the kids that don't, are not able to go to charter schools? I also kind of look at this as a racial issue because you defund charter, uh, you, excuse me, you defund public education for a number of years and you put up this uh, other entity that clearly on the surface looks good, less kids in a class, you know, no. This is unacceptable and we cannot allow this to pass. It is not an anti-charter, it's an anti-lift the cap. My question to anybody out there that is uh, yes on two, what are you going to do with the other 80% of the kids who are right. struggling and those teachers who are trying to do a really Talk good job? Talk about not a level playing field, right? Right in our face and right in our backyard. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. That was quick, wasn't yes, it? it? was. Well, thank you for coming. I hope you'll come back. Thank you. And good luck on Election Day. Um, a couple you. of weeks. How many more weeks? Like uh, it's coming. Four. It's it coming. Is. It's coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.